Okay, now we're all awake. Yeah, we're all in. Darn Can people hear me? I don't sure. Yeah. I don't know. Can people hear me now? I had a piece. No. Use your microphone. Yeah, hi. Okay. Okay, everyone can hear me now. Okay. So, uh, welcome to the Division Echo. Yeah, Nona, make sure that your um, sound is off on your computer. Muted. 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, you can't use this, this computer. I think it's good. Let's see if we're, are we still getting the echo? I think we're. How about now? Okay. We're Great. good. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, I'm going to call this meeting to order at 402. And I'm going to do a roll call. So D, yes. Nona, yes. Wanda, yes. MJ, and Jennifer Hammer. OK, so we're, we're all in attendance. Um, so welcome to the Wildfire Preparedness Committee meeting. So tonight, we only have one thing on our agenda, which is a workshop by the fire district on the latest version of the Vegetation Draft Ordinance 2303. A copy of that ordinance is in the agenda packet. The workshop will consist of a presentation and then a question and answer session. Uh, committee members will start out the question session with one question each, and then we'll move to residents. I wanna make sure that they have time. And then if there's time at the end, we can come back and ask more committee questions. Um, I'd like to remind the audience that you will have three minutes to make your comment or ask your question. As in all Portola Valley public meetings, there are no follow-up questions unless the fire district asks for input. And I wanna also remind everyone that we will be hosting another workshop on January 15th at 6.30. Um, and the fire district will again make a, a presentation about 2303. And I wanna also take this opportunity to sincerely um, thank the fire district and especially our um, soon to be new fire marshal, Kim Giuliacci, for taking the time to give these workshops. This is incredibly helpful to our committee and to the residents of the district. Um, I also wanna thank them for giving us two months to learn and to make comments about this draft ordinance before it goes to a vote. Um, of the district board in late January. So with that, we've just got a, a, a few uh, quick procedural items and we'll start the workshop. Um, does anyone have any oral communications for items not on the agenda? Okay. I'm going to um, move to approve minutes uh, because of a computer glitch. Um, our secretary was not able to have minutes available last month. So we have two months of, a, of meetings, uh, minutes to approve. So I'd like to um, call for the approval of the October 18th minutes. Show up, the show of hands. Nona? Oh, okay. So they, um, pass, uh, they get approved in unit unanimously. And then um, I'd like to move that the sub September 20th minutes are approved. Okay, show of hands. Okay, so they're approved. Okay, so with that, uh, we're going to, um, Kim Giuliacci is going to start our presentation on ordinance 2303. We get to go back just one more slide, just for a quick second. So, uh, back one more. Okay, just so I can introduce it. So this is going to be it's in draft form. Um, good evening, everyone. First, thank you for coming today. Uh, for those of you if you're on Zoom, and for all of those that came here in person today, um, and thank you to my fellow supporters, uh, some of the some of the people from the fire district. I have our deputy fire marshal, Marshal Hurd, and um, one of our inspectors, Michael Temez, and our fuel mitigation engineer, Dan, uh, is with us today. So thanks, you guys, for coming. 
And we are going to be talking about today ordinance number 2303. And this will have its first reading set for the January meeting with our fire board. That'll be the first meeting. And if all goes well, then we will do the second reading in February and for adoption. The name of the, in short terms, a very long title for this ordinance. So to make it short, it's the Fuel Mitigation and Exterior Hazard Abatement Ordinance. Next slide, please. I'm just going to, and we can go, we can lower the volume on this one a little bit, but I'm just going to show a video and we'll have to do a little fast forwarding through it because I wanted to start with this just to give an idea and an understanding as to why this ordinance, this is just one example, but how these ordinances come to be um, and to give people an understanding really of how vegetation how quickly vegetation burns and how quickly homes will burn. So you can go ahead and start this. I'm gonna just be talking uh, through the video, but if the volume's too loud on it, Nona, you could just turn the volume down. That way I can speak through it. You won't have sound because her- Oh, perfect, her that's good. I don't want sound, okay. Will there not be sound at all available? Because there's another video that sound would be important. Okay, well, since it's going to be um, pub since it's going to be available for people to see later, you can you can watch the videos. I can just talk through it. It won't. But once this gets published, you'll be able to, and I can resend the, the actual presentation for it to go into the minutes. But so this video, it, it's, it's the Melody fire. It was a fire in Reno. And what happened is this is sagebrush and it's incredible in nine minutes what happens. So these people are on the freeway, they're just driving to wherever they're going and they see a hillside that started burning. They don't know how, there's no, no reason, it was just the middle of the sagebush and it starts to run up. You can kind of see how it's getting to the house. It starts to burn one of the houses, then it's burning the house next to it. And then through that, another avenue off the sagebrush starts to go up to a different house. Within nine minutes, all, there is a total of five houses that are completely engulfed and burning. And the reason for the video that I wanted people to understand is what happened is there's no fuel break between that sagebrush and the balconies and the homes of how these houses were located. It's a big thing to have your vegetation and distance. And that's why we push so much for distance and what is underneath your decks and what's abutted up to your decks. Because with that fuel, when that fire is coming through, it doesn't have a problem burning a house, especially everything that's wood. Um, it burns pretty fast. And it was just amazing to watch in nine minutes how much damage happened to these homes. You'll also notice in the video that once the sage was done burning, it was done. It, it, there was no more, it wasn't burning anymore. Basically, it extinguished itself. All that kept burning was the houses because homes are, have such a huge fuel load. But that's what vegetation does. Once it runs out of fuel, it just it just extinguishes. So um, it's a great opportunity. It's on YouTube, so it's accessible. You can just type in Melody Fire Reno and you'll get this and you'll, you'll be able to watch it. So we can move on to the next slide. So for the ordinance, I wanted to just start with a little bit of the legal language before we get into the nitty gritty of the presentation. Um, so I highlight this because this is the most important part of what this section is talking about. And it's the reason for having this ordinance. And it talks about embers and firebrands and how they travel because sometimes we think just fire fronts when a wildfire is coming through 
we forget that it's not really just the fire front that endangers our homes. It's those fire brands, as they call them, which are the embers, that is the effect of those and how far they can travel miles and miles. And those are what starts fires. And there's a reason, um, there's been a lot of research with the big fires that we've had recently in the last five years. There's been research as to what is damage, what those fire brands are doing to homes and why certain measures we've added into this ordinance came to be. So I just wanted to highlight that because that's the important part of why this ordinance is where it is. You can move to the next slide, please. Another portion of the findings of fact is the reason for this ordinance. And it comes down to, we took a template that the state of California created. So they created a defensible space template for jurisdictions to be able to use as a guide to write this type of ordinance. We have kept the template the same with, with only two changes in it. And I will highlight to you what those two additions were while when we do the presentation but it really is very minor what we, what we added. But otherwise, it's exactly what the state recommends. And the reason for it is to decrease the risk of the structure fire spreading from one structure to the next and with the vegetation that connects all our structures together. Next slide, please. One of the big things in this ordinance, and you'll soon see, is our zone zero ember resistant zone. And that's going to be one of the biggest challenges we'll be facing is the changing our mindset of how we view our homes or how we landscape our homes, because this is where you're going to see where wildfires are really affecting homes. And with the studies that NIST has done and large other corporations that have put millions of dollars into research um, have found that this is, this is what really is what, what's burning down the majority of, of of communities is in fact the embers. And it's the zero to five foot zone from your house to your vegetation is creating that separation um, between them. And that's our ember resistance uh, zone. Next slide, please. So who does this ordinance apply to? Again, this ordinance is available to everybody. It's online. It was on the agenda packet. So I'm not gonna go through every word of the slide, but I just kind of listed the basics of, at the bottom, you'll see it basically affects everybody. <laughs> so rather than giving all the lingo language, it does apply to everyone. So whether it's a new parcel existing, if it's any, if you, if you live and have a, a home here or a business or whatever it is, any kind of structure or building, this ordinance will apply to you. Next slide. So here's the, now that's past that legal language part. Now we're going to get into the actual requirements. I picked this picture just because it was nice and big and it just gives you a kind of enlarged view of zones zero, one, and two, and then everything in between. But these are going to be our mitigation requirements now. Next zone, next slide. So beginning with zone zero, this is the ember resistant zone, and this is going to be from zero to five feet from your building, your structure. And if you have an attached deck, that is part of your structure. So wherever your deck extends to zero to five feet from your deck, that would be part of that ember resistant zone. So it's basically going to be. And here's the thing that people misunderstand. We're not saying if you have a tree that you need to get it, that you need to remove it. If it's a if it's a healthy living tree, it's going to be a different. It's going to be more of limbing your trees, pulling them away from your structure, um, making sure that there's clearance and separation between the tree and your home. If it's overhanging your home, there's all the distance requirements are listed there. But if it's overhanging your home, you want it away from your the roof of your house. You're wanting to start with your home and clearing and clearing from there out. So at your home, it's you know removing all your leaves and everything from your gutters and your roofs and hardscaping around your home that zero to five feet. If you have a uh, ground covering, as long as it's irrigated, that's fine because it's, it's ground covering. So there hasn't been anything that shows that that would create any kind of, of danger, but the danger is the mulch, the wood chips, all the things that 
when we once created a drought resistant type of atmosphere because of the drought, that's what we started to replace everything with, was with mulch and, and, and you know, wood chips. So we wanna come away with that. And you know anything that you can put around that would be more non-combustible, whether it's um, pavers or cement, anything that's gonna make that, that distance at zero to five feet more, um, more uh, resistive to fire. Next, next slide. This is just a, and here, this is actually a, a video that sound would have been good, but I can talk through it. Um, but you could see these are two fires where the, these are the fire embers that were flying from distances and catching homes. And you could see the vegetation that's up against the house in the left picture and how the firefighters kind of work in trying to extinguish that all around the house. And then in the other picture, they're, they're providing structure protection to that house because of the embers that are flying all around. Will it let you play? Let's see if it lets you play this video. So this was a, um, it was out of Irvine. I think it was Channel 5 or Channel 7 News broadcasted it. But it's a demonstration. No, okay. It's a demonstration that basically shows two homes. They built two model homes, small, you know, a few hundred square feet. And what they did is they made one as just as if it was our homes with vegetation all around it, um, bark around the house. And then they made one with the zero to five ember resistant zone. And they light, they light both of them, you know, a little distance apart showing like fire coming through as if it was a wildfire and it ignites and it starts, it starts to burn. Well, you'll see the one that doesn't have the ember resistant zone completely gets engulfed. I mean, gone, done. But the one that had the ember resistant, that zero to five foot clearance, it stopped at the vegetation that was outside of that five foot area and it just extinguished itself. Nothing happened to the home. And they had the commissioner who's the, um, the head of the insurance industry. He actually said, and that was the whole point of why, um, which is good for people that are, because we're so concerned with insurance being so high and, and how it's dropping people. But he was basically stating that this is why insurance companies aren't writing policies is because they can't measure the hazard. There's no, they're looking at the hazards and they're saying, we're not going to write for people. And he's saying, an insurance company is not like a utility. They don't have to provide you in coverage. And so the whole goal of, the, of that video that they put on the news was to show the importance of starting to create these ember resistant zones because it's going to help reduce the risk to try and keep those policies and so that insurance companies will continue to write policies for your home. So it's another great video um, and that'll be published as well. So you can go to that link and be able to watch it. And I will have this presentation as well on our website. So just in case, you know, any, if you're trying to look for it, I'll post it on our website as well so that you'll be able to watch these videos. Next slide, please. So the zone one, we call it the lean, clean and green zone. And that's because you're just really thinning out your vegetation. You're not removing everything around your home, the vegetation that we love to have, that is the whole reason that makes this, you know, this district as beautiful as it is, the communities that we all live in. It's, it's maintenance. It's removing all the dry vegetation, everything that's dead. It's limbing up all the trees. It's, you know, creating some kind of separation between your vegetation, even if they're grouped into islands, or if you separate some of your bushes, but if you notice, there are bushes that have a lot of dead vegetation. Those need to be thinned out. You need to remove what's the dead fuel load from those. So zone one, and as it shows here, it just tells you, it gives you a guide of how you're supposed to maintain your property in that zone one area. That includes relocating any exposed firewood into zone two, unless you have a fire resistant cover around your wood, it's okay for it to be in zone one but it's still recommended to keep it away and put it into zone two. Um, but otherwise, everything else, it's all listed here. It's pretty basic. Same things that we've been doing. This is nothing, honestly, some of these things in the, the zones, 
as far as defensible space goes. It's nothing, nothing you haven't seen before. Next slide, please. With the fuel separation, one of the things that it talked about was there being um, vertical and horizontal clearance. So I wanted to touch on that a little bit to help give you an understanding and a visual of what that actually means. So first, we're looking at the minimum clearance from the ground. You're wanting to limb up your tree six feet up, and it can go all the way up to 15 feet, depending on the height of your tree. Then if you look at the, uh, the vertical clearance of how it's showing the X, and then it says 3X next to it, what it means is if, if you have bushes underneath your tree, whatever the height of your bush is, let's say it's you know two feet, you're gonna take that two feet and the distance between that bush and the lowest part of the tree above it, you multiply that by three times. And that's the height difference that you should have between your bush and the bottom parts of the limbs on your tree. Um, so this again, it's clearly, it's in our appendix, it's in appendix A. You can do your fuel separation. It needs to be both vertical and horizontal, but there are two different ways of how you can um, get your separation and it's here, we'll go over it, but this is just for the vertical clearance. Next slide, please. The horizontal distance is the more challenging one only because there are a lot of hills and slopes. So this is what's recommended. And again, this is not, um, it's all gonna take time. We've spent many, many years getting to where we are now. So I don't expect this to be an overnight magical, we're gonna wave our wand and it's gonna be to perfection. This is going to be a work in progress but we have to have a plan. And this is the plan to help get us to that goal over time. So when you're looking at this, it's eventually getting to where you have this separation, this horizontal separation, because fire runs very quickly uphill. And that was part of the point of the first video, the Melody Fire in Reno, was to show how quickly fire went from the bottom of that hill in a sagebrush all the way to burning all those homes. But this gives you an, a, a sample, depending on slope, the separation between your, between your trees. And this horizontal spacing is basically to eliminate that ladder fuel that's going from vegetation to vegetation all the way up to where your home sits. And it should be kept that way even if, so let's say you had a hillside, but you have the whole front of your hillside, that horizontal separation applies to the whole hillside. And, you know, uh, at the end of this, uh, presentation, there'll be, be my contact as well. I'm always happy to answer emails and questions if, there, if you need more clarity on this, because this can take a little time to really wrap your head around. Next slide, please. So the continuous tree canopy requirement, this is appendix in appendix B. This is the one between the fuel separation, the continuous tree canopy requirement. It's a combination of both or one or the other. It kind of depends on the topography and what you're surrounded with at your house. So what this is just talking about is basically, again, the limbing up of your trees and grouping your, if you have many trees, to have them in islands. Um, and if you have single specimen trees or other trees, um, we want people to understand that we're not saying to take all your trees out. So it's just really important to keep that in mind. It's not to remove every tree on your property, but it's just maintaining your trees. Next slide, please. So zone two is the reduced fuel zone. And basically this is now just reducing everything that's outside. So this is, we're still within are 100 feet of a defensible space. This is that last zone from your, um, from your 30 to 100 feet of your zones. Same information. It's basically a repeat on what zone two, uh, sorry, what zones one says, um, except that now all your wood piles can be located in this, in this zone. And you don't have to have that fire resistive cover. It's always a good recommendation. Anything that you can reduce your fuel load is always best. And if you, have, um, if you have your annual grasses and everything, those need to be cut down to four inches. So that's what the recommended height is with all of the grasses and weeds that you have on your property. Next slide, please. This just applies to all your zones and it's just your, again, your 100 feet total defensible space. 
is uh, one of the big things, and this isn't a change, but just something that was included in this ordinance is for those who have the propane tanks, is putting those on, making sure that all the vegetation is cleared around it. Um, you want at least 10 feet around your propane tank, or if it's on you know, cement pavers, something that's non-combustible, but we don't want any type of vegetation, especially dead, anything around it. Um, same thing with your, if you have sheds or other buildings, pool, pool houses, storage sheds, those also, you have to treat those as, a, as just another structure. I know it's not something that people are living in, but it's still a structure and it still presents a danger to your neighbors as well as your own property. So that should be maintained just the same, clear of vegetation, trees, nothing overhanging branches over the rooftops, um, removing all dead leaves. And the other thing that um, I think it might be on the next slide, but the other thing to know is, you know, we have ground covering, which is fine. And, you know, over time you have that buildup of mulch or you have the buildup of leaves. If it is fine to keep that up to a four, four inches is the most that you want, because they were showing studies were showing that that thickness layer on what's on the ground how much of it actually will spread, will create flame heights and spread vegetation to other vegetation. So that four inch was kind of like that magic number. If it's below that, not seeing that carrying on and creating these high um, flame, flame lengths. Next, uh, oh, and one more thing, this might be something new. Um, well, in this ordinance is, and people for people to understand, is having any vegetation on your house, like vines, ivy, all that, that's kind of was a decorative on your home, that, that's something that'll have to get removed. We wanna move, remove all the vegetation from any structure. So that might be a change for those of you who have it on your roofs and along the walls of your homes or any structure. Next slide, please. As far as adjacent parcels are, we are still looking at the 100 feet. So if you have a shed and that shed is within 100 feet to another structure, then you have to maintain that defensible space from that shed to the next structure. So just because that shed is outside your 100 feet of your own structure, it's within 100 feet of your neighbor's structure. So you are also responsible to make sure you create that defensible space for your neighbor. That's basically what mainly what this is talking about. Next slide, please. Um, this is another video, and I'll just explain this one. This was put out by a study by NIST, and what they did was they showed how fence, the dangers of fences, especially wooden ones that are attached to our homes. It's basically like putting a candle wick and lighting it, and it just goes straight to your house. And that goes for, and we do have a lot of neighborhoods like that. I understand this, and I know it's going to be a change, but nonetheless, something to consider when we're building our fences and what materials we're, we're building them out of. But if you have existing fences, the recommendation is pull that fence six feet from your house so that you don't have that wooden connection to your home and you're creating basically a fuel break is what you're creating by having that six foot separation from your fence to your house. And if you're putting up new fences, then you should be considering non-combustible um, materials, not wood. Next slide, please. Oh, maybe it'll play. <laughs> they do actually talk through this video, but the words also help. Okay. You don't have to say a lot of words to get the point across. <laughs> Is there another slide? Yeah, next slide, yeah. Okay, next uh, part of the ordinance is the enforcement part. So there's a couple of ways that um, enforcement gets used. So first, let me stress that, which will be on the next slide, we will talk about the phased approach. But as far as enforcement goes, this, is, this was put in place mainly for people who 
you know, just really don't do anything to their property aside from the many efforts that we make to try to work with people and tell them what they need to do and explain to them what needs to be done and just nothing gets done. And so now we have a system that's called Fire Aside, and that's a software that we use to do our defensible space inspections. And when we do them, it's going to outline, and it, it does a great job with separating home hardening and defensible space, and it really breaks it down to you on what are the things that, that need to be done. So when we do those, um, we will be able to pull those inspections you know, go back for a visit, see what's been done. If nothing's been done, well, again, the great thing, it's a living document. The document on Fireside, it's constantly changing or not changing. So unless anything gets fixed, it's going to stay the way it is, but it's going to show the number of days that it's been in violation. And when we do those reinspections, that's where we're going to start seeing with despite our efforts, because we'll always notify the, the homeowner will confirm that they have received a report. We will send them multiple reports. And when it gets to the point where we have to go down an enforcement route, it'll be, hey, this is your final chance. We're letting you know that we're going to be going down this process if we don't hear back from you. As long as we hear back from a homeowner saying, hey, I'm sorry, you know, I've had this going on and can you give me another month to at least do this or whatever? We, we want to work with people. We want to support people get through what they need to do. But if we don't hear back from anyone, then we need to start going down another route because this is a danger to our community. And we know the, the hazard and the risk that it's putting around the neighbors. So one of two ways we can go about a property. One of the ways is doing an abatement. Well, we'll go through and we'll abate the property. With this, we will abate, we will take the invoice, we will supply it to the homeowner. They have to pay it at their expense. If they do not pay it, then, you know, there is days, you know, in law, it gives you, you know, 10 days. So if there's days for everything, right? So that's all a legal part, but just in summary, um, and you can also appeal anything. There's also an appeal process. But anyway, with the abatement, so once they, and they still don't pay, then we report it to the county assessor's office. The clerk takes it in and then it becomes a lien on the, they put a lien on your, on your property. That's one way. The other way is we also have now, which we adopted last year, an administrative citation. And basically this is kind of similar where we, we keep giving you, we will be fining you, we'll issue a citation that needs to be paid. And it'll stay with every day that's in, it's in violation, you're just paying more and more money and it'll just keep getting bigger and bigger. So those are the basic two routes of enforcement that, that we have. But again, it's, it is a process. It's a process that we would not, that's not the goal. It's not our preference to go down a legal path, but if we have to, then you know, then that's so, so be it. But it always seems like when we get pretty close to that, people start to feel like, oh, I don't want to go. And we start to get compliance. Our preference would be just to get compliance from the get-go because you want to, because you want to do it for yourself and you want to do it for your, for your community. Next slide, please. So here's the phase compliance. Now, in legal terms, because we had to do this, there is a process for a phase compliance because of financial hardship. So there's two sides to this. This is the unwritten side because, you know, legal has to stay legal, but phase compliance, we don't have to, we will still work with homeowners regardless, you know, with the financial hardship, just because it's still, you don't, it doesn't have to be a financial hardship for it to be one. If you if you understand what I'm saying, it, it's going to be an impact for everyone. And we understand that. So as long as we put together the inspectors working with the homeowner saying, okay, we did your dis dispensable space inspection. Here's the plan for this year. Let's concentrate on these things. And then that'll be the goal for this year. And then for next year, this is going to be the goal for next year. And then setting forward those goals to help make it more attainable and something that as a homeowner, you can say, okay, I, if I spread this out in a year, I can totally do this. And so, but this is the, but in the ordinance, it does have, if you are doing it for financial reasons, 
there is a process that you have to file to go through the financial hardship, which we will work with you in that way also with, um, with that understanding. But we do have other resources to offer to help those that have that financial hardship. Next slide, please. So this is just side notes. I wanted to, this isn't in the ordinance, but just to make clear, because I had a feeling that many people were going to just have these questions in general. So vacant lots, it is not in this ordinance, the fuel mitigation ordinance. This is the vacant lots um, that is in our nuisance ordinance, which has already been adopted. So with vacant lots, there is a responsibility on the homeowner as well to maintain that property. So there are requirements um, you still follow the same requirements that are all, all in this fuel mitigation, but where we can, um, where we have our authority to make sure you abate it is within our nuisance ordinance. And through there, there's also a process that if a homeowner still, again, does not want to work with us and complete that abatement process for their vacant lot, we can also go through the same enforcement action of abating it ourselves and then giving them the bill to pay for it. As far as decking material, this has been a, I know this has been a big question and I wish, once I tell you my answer, I wish I could give you all a better answer, but it's the answer there is right now. <laughs> so I feel the frustration as a homeowner, but in this case, which rarely happens, the code, the code requirements were out before industry could catch up. And what the code requires as far as approved materials for your decking, there's not a lot out there that meets the requirements that the code has put forth. So if you're able to, this is just my recommendation as a person saying it to other people, when you do come across materials that are being approved, I would highly suggest maybe sharing it with the community to help them out that you found something and that got approved by the building department because again, and I wrote it up here, this is under the building department's authority. This is not under, I know it is for fire resistive measures, but it's not under our wheelhouse. And the building department can only approve what's in the residential code and what's in the building code. And those things and the listings that are required in there are not necessarily what a lot of materials out there are available. So as community people, I would say, hey, share it with your neighbors, create, start putting together a list of the approved material so it can help other homeowners out from the frustration of trying to find something that's approved. Next slide, please. Uh, so now I'm just gonna talk about our Fireside program because it's something for everyone to start getting familiar with because this is a software that's going to be used to do all the defensible space inspections. You're gonna get a report and on your report, and it comes by email. So for us, it's really important to, we're building up a database of people's emails because it gets delivered to you by email. But our preference is that people start calling us to do their defensible space inspections. We would prefer to walk with homeowners in doing these inspections so that we can educate, so we can spend time with you, so we can develop these plans with you. So if, you're, if you can call us and set up an inspection, we would be happy to meet you at that time because if we don't, we're just going to properties and if people are home, we knock on the door and people are home, that's great. But when you're not, it's kind of like we're just, we're just doing this report and, and sending it out. And so this two things, if you're not home, the way we get the information to you, we will leave a door hanger on your door or gate, whatever we have accessible to us. And on it, on the hanger, it actually has a code. And it's, it's unique to you, to you only. So you'll go online, you'll create an account, and you'll enter this code. And this code is what accesses your specific report. This is a confidential report. This is only between you and the fire district. And it is our means of communicating to you. This is the things we found. Within this software, as a homeowner, you're able to upload photos. You can, um, so when you upload photos, so you'll see, and that's why I put some samples here. We'll take pictures and we'll circle things and we'll mark exactly what we're talking about. So if you have a dead tree, you have broom plants, grasses and weeds, whatever it is, we'll take a picture and that picture gets attached to whatever that violation is that's noted, you'll get the code section and you'll get what we're at, and you'll get a note saying, giving you direction on what to do. 
But when you correct it, you can take a picture of that same area and upload it and it'll ping us and lets us know homeowner has uploaded new information and we can go into the software and be able to look, oh, okay, they did fix this. Now, sometimes we can't tell in pictures, which in the fact we end up having to go back and just do a reinspection, just because sometimes it's hard to tell certain areas with photos. But if it's a photo that we can say, oh, okay, I told, I know what this is and I, I could see they corrected it. We can mark it on our end as being, as being corrected. And then it updates your report. And every time your report gets touched and updated, you get a new version of your report. It'll come back to you. So you'll start seeing your list of what you need to do getting smaller and smaller as you start to correct everything. All those little, so on your report, you'll, you'll get an overview of what your parcel looks like. Um, that is an example of many violations, but that's our office. <laughs> so that's not someone's home. <laughs> And it's not because we have a lot of violations, it's because it's our testing address. <laughs> so whenever we didn't know how something worked, we would just use our address to test features. So that's why there's so many little dots. But yours would look similar with having dots. Those dots are plotted points to show you where we found different things on your parcel as far as what violations were. On there, there's a link. And um, I don't know if you can, if you're able to click on it, Nona, will it work? At the top, yeah, right above that, it, yep, that one. Maybe, maybe not. Let's see. Oh, it's coming up on another. Okay, that's okay. But so basically, this link it just gives you a sample of a, what a report looks like, just so you can get familiar with how it kind of runs, how it looks, how it how it details things, and how it shows you how you need to correct things. That's pretty much. Okay, if you're able to, yeah. You'll probably have to stop share and then go find it on your other screen. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> no, that's good. So the report, um, and I don't know if you can scroll through Nona, but so it'll start with just a quick summary. It'll give you how many, what was, how many issues were found in the dispensable space issues. And then if you scroll down, Nona, it'll show you a number for what was identified for home hardening. There we go. And then keep scrolling down. It'll show you your risk. It'll show you a plotted point of every, everywhere that was found. And then you can keep scrolling through. It'll show you your responsibilities. And if you hit continue, now it'll start to break down. It starts with defensible space and keep scrolling through. And a little bit more, yeah, there you go. So just to show a quick example. So it'll highlight what was found and what you need to do. And it'll show you where in your parcel that it was found. Um, this doesn't show the, I didn't do any, I should have done now that I think about it. I didn't do the interface side of what it looks like on the customer side, if you were uh, as a homeowner going in and what it looks like. But from what I've heard feedback from other people, it's fairly user-friendly. It's pretty simple. You go to it, you can hit upload, you upload your photo and it just transmits. But that's an example of what the report would look like. That's pretty much it. Okay, perfect. Next slide. Yes, perfect. I only brought this up just to bring it to some of your attention because there is, um, which I would, so next year, not in January, because we're going to do a second workshop for this, but 
I'll send out information, but in the beginning, first quarter-ish of the new year, maybe March-ish, I do want to do a, a workshop on our, our ordinances in general because they're still important for people to have an understanding so that you know how to, the things that are pertinent to your home. For example, if you have um, a private hydrant, you are responsible to test and maintain it. That'll be something that'll identify it in your defensible space inspection and also clearance. So you'll see on the left, you'll see all those green leaves and everything. And you can kind of see a hydrant sort of poking its head out somewhere there. So the hydrants require three feet of clearance around them. And this is stuff that's in the fire code, but we're still going to be, even though it's not a defensible space thing, part of our annual inspection is still also, we're still looking at things from the fire code as far as your property is concerned. For example, and then another one is the address on the mailbox. You can't see the address. So I can't stress to everybody, first of all, at night, the community, there's not a lot of light. In the new or fire code ordinance and new construction, it is now required to put illuminated addresses, whether it's internally illuminated or externally illuminated. Addresses are so important for our emergency response. And I'm not talking about wildfire or anything. I'm just talking about some, a medical somebody having a medical event and every, every second matters, us delaying because we can't find an address or because we can't see it, it is so important. So when we do our annual inspections, we do identify if your address is in compliance or not, but the address is a big thing. Having something that's four, in, depending on how distance, but at least four inches tall, that's on you know, a back, that's not the same color as your mailbox, that it's on contrasting color something that's visually, if you can't see it at night, you know we're having issues when we're coming to a place that is already difficult to see at night. But we'll identify things like there's extension cords running on that deck. We don't want extension cords um, running through any kind of wood surfaces or vegetation. So just so you could see, just examples, we will mark those things on your, on your defensible space inspections. Next slide, please. This is something else, nothing to do with fuel mitigation, but it's something that I've been trying to educate residents on to understand something. And there is, there's this thing called a wooey placard system. Basically what this is, is when there's a wildfire, the fire department, us, Woodside Fire, they're going to be going to wherever that fire started. As the fire spreads or gets bigger, we don't have obviously enough resources to handle it all. So we, so we call out for other agencies to come help us. When a wildfire gets big enough, this placard system is a means of how fire departments communicate with each other. And it breaks it down. When they go out, they placard a home. They basically are assessing a house. They're looking at if this home is defendable or not. Is this a good place for firefighters? Can they defend this home safely? And do they have a means to get out? So they look at if there's what kind of sources of water are on this property. They do look at your 100 feet of defensible space. Because even though we talk about 100 feet of defensible space for fires, it is also for firefighters to safely be able to stand and protect and fight. If they don't have anything around them, to, if they're in a whole bunch of, they're not going to be somewhere where it's heavily vegetated to do protection. That That's don't forget, as everyone's leaving, it's them that are putting their lives to protect your property. So this is a means of how they assess your homes, which is another reason why the defensible space, our home, the home hardening efforts are important because they will be assessing your home. And if it's not something that they can defend, it'll just be shown with numbers to say, yeah, pass this one up, go on to the next one. And these do are they do write times and dates on them and they just keep putting a new one on top of them every time as events change. And this is just how they keep communication. So I just think it's valuable for people to know part of what, what the courses of action that happened during a wildfire. Next slide, please. So takeaways, this is the kind of getting to the end I just wanted to show a little bit of a picture. I've seen a lot of homes. I think, I mean, if you've even been to Arizona, which it was interesting to me to see deserted land, but you can still create that separation from your home, that hardscape. They did a lot there. That's obviously more than five feet, 
but just to show that you could still have your beautiful vegetation and everything that we love so much about living here and still having that zero to five feet zone. I know that's gonna be the biggest challenge that we face right now for the next few years to get used to this transition and starting to kind of change things over. Nonetheless, it's something that we, that we need to do. Um, not just because just for our homes, but if, if we're looking at reducing our hazards, we wanna keep those insurance companies, we do need to reduce those hazards. So hardening your structure, doing your space, doing all your spacing between your vegetation. Um, it's going to be year round, quite honestly. I know we have um, fire season, but really fire season shouldn't matter with maintenance of our homes and around our homes. That's, that's going to be, that's a year round thing because, you know, our seasons, we don't have them anymore. They're kind of all the, over the place. So our vegetation is all over the place. We have dry stuff in January. We have dry in November. I mean, it really doesn't matter. So it's going to be a constant maintenance of removing everything that's dead and dying. And using our hard, in, for your hardscape, you know, using gravel, there's examples, concrete. There's lots of different things that we can do to hardscape our house. And then the last slide, just want to thank everybody for being here again. I know we're going to do our questions and comments, but I just wrote up these two things because I was listening to a podcast and this woman was talking about, her name is Nancy Watkins, a, a homeowner that got very active in um, defensible space and home hardening. And she had said, you know, I only got involved in this because it was important to me. And it made me think that's the whole point of what we're trying to do here. Yes, I know we have a legal document, this ordinance we're putting out there. But is what we're trying to do, if it's important to you and you want to reduce the hazard, live in a, in a beautiful, in a still beautiful but maintained place, then you would, then you would do something about it. And we all need to work on it. It's, it's going to be a group effort. It's a community effort. Everyone's got to do their part. And I know that a lot weighs on insurance companies, but another thing she said that really weighed on me, I was thinking, cause it's always like, well, we have to do these things because our insurances were getting dropped and this and that, but the goal should just be reducing the hazard. Not so much that we can get a lower premium on our insurance um, is, you know, making our communities firewise. Firewise is a great way to start because it kind of helps having support from your neighbors of all of you working on this together which is the point of Firewise. Firewise's point is to encourage and support neighbors and to create that community. So this ordinance is, is put in place to give you some guidelines to go by, but really the work is, is up to our community and to our neighbors to really make this, because you could still make a beautiful neighborhood, a beautiful community. It just takes maintenance. So thank you, everybody. So thank you. That, that was so informative and so well prepared. Um, thank you so much. So I'm gonna start with taking one question from every committee member, and then we'll take questions from people in the schoolhouse, and then we'll move to people um, online. So who, who would like to start with a question? No question. Wanda, go ahead. If somebody wants to participate and have an inspection, what is the process they go through and what happens after they go through the process? And I will tell you, I've had inspectors out on my property. Easiest process is calling right now. We don't, we're working on setting up an online where you can go on our website and um, do an inspection, schedule an inspection online. We're not there yet. We're working on it. But for now, it would be calling our administration office and Dee Dee, who is our administrator, she will schedule the inspection for you. And then an inspector will come out and meet with you. They'll write up your report. It'll get emailed to you within 48 hours of completing the inspection. And then once you have that, you can either, either we can go over, depending on, and it all depends on the homeowner, we can just give the inspection report that gets emailed to you and have a nice day or it'll be, we can go through it and you, you know, as a homeowner can say, okay, what do you think are the most important things? What should I start with? And that inspector will work with you on discussing those things and will be notated for you so that at least we know 
these are the goals. Again, like I said, having that plan, it'll be notated. These are the goals for this year. And then that's pretty much it until you start making changes or corrections. Either you upload the photos on your portal or you call us and schedule us to come back and do a reinspection and we'll come back and do a reinspection of the property. So it just becomes an ongoing until everything is in compliance. So it just keeps rolling over from reinspection to reinspection. I mean, the reinspections will at this point be going on for a long time until everything gets up to where it needs to be. So to get started, they can go to your website and look at the phone number and call me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any other questions from the committee? Yes. Do you envision there being an educational component to the inspection beyond <clears throat> the individual homeowner? So for example, you know, if someone really cleans up their property, you have before and after photos then, right? Um, or if they have a neighbor who's done it and it would be really beneficial for other people to see that. Is there an educational component that you envision as part of this? I think it's a great idea. Um, it would be great to be able to show, as long as homeowners are okay with it, I mean, not to show that like an address, but just to show a property of saying, here's an example of, this is where they started, this is where we got up to. But yes, I can definitely see that as being something we can do. Um, you did touch on something that made me think of one thing we are working on is a separate document that's just a guideline that kind of outside of the legal terms just gives a homeowner actually a, a guideline to follow to be able to do what this is saying, but just something more simpler. So that is something that we're working on, and that will be something that will be pushed out and um, posted on our website. That would be great. I think there aren't that many houses in Portola Valley that look like the slide that you showed. So. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Wow, boy, your, your presentation was very good. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so to follow up on no, Nona's comment, I, I would also love to see the inspectors uh, educate homeowners on ember resistant vents when they're talking about zone zero. So I have a question about zone zero and I'm thinking about, we have all these wooden homes and there's wooden decks, but then there's this, it's not exactly hardscape, but it is somewhat permanent. So we have wooden planters that are built into decks. We have wooden railings. We have wooden steps along the home. I know in the ranch, um, the only kind of step you can really have on a hill is you know the four by four rails. And is that, when you have an inspection, will that be something that the inspector says you need to be thinking of removing because you'll be in violation of code or is that something that's grandfathered in? So there are certain things that certainly um, not, I don't wanna say grandfathered in, but it's as existent. So we call it existing non-conforming. It's a big, it's a big word in, in the fire service when it comes to prevention, because when new, when laws are being put into place, we can't require, it would just be like saying, okay, you have a wood house, you got to all replace it now with, you know, you got, we can't, you can't do that. Now, if you remodel or do new construction, that's a whole different story, but that kind of falls in the same line with that. It would be the recommendations of saying, because you have these, these are the things you need to make sure you do to help you reduce that hazard. So everything is really a case by case um, component. And that's where it's important for an inspector to walk with the homeowner so that that can be a discussion to say, yeah, you have this, but let's focus on this because this is going to help mitigate that this is already existing. Okay. All right. Why, why don't we take questions from um, attendees in the schoolhouse? If you have a question, just uh, come up and ask your question in the microphone. I don't know if the microphone at the table is working or if Kim wants to share hers. Or... Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah, Kim, you can come over and sit there and then... or you can use Kim's microphone too. Yeah, go ahead and go to the podium. Yeah. Is, I, quick before we get started, is this inspection the same as the defensible space one or it's, it's a, 
It's on that same form? Mm -hmm. Okay, because yes. it's a different person to call because I just did that. Okay, my question about this one is homes and decks that are built around redwood trees. I have 10 or 12, like right next to me. They're, and they're huge, 100 foot tall redwood trees. So with, with those, that would be the recommendation of, um, and again, case by case, because I'd have to see to understand, but that would be where we'd want to prune those trees, keep them, okay. yeah, limit, limiting them up if they're overhanging on your rooftop. I mean, it's when you're looking at rooftops, it's 15 feet. So as long as those tree limbs or the branches are at least 15 feet away from your house, that's fine but it becomes just a pruning of your trees just to keep them as far away from your structure. We've had like the defensible space every year. Yeah. They come and trim it up and stuff, but it's like right there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and there's nothing really you can do with those, you know, we can only mitigate the best you can with what you have that's existing. Well, well so would you mind identifying yourself for our minutes? Patricia Nelson, Martinez Road, Woodside. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, my name's Bill Maimon. Probably can spell my name. <laughs> I've seen it before, but some of you at least know. Um, uh, so Firewise Community Organizer, big supporter of this. One other educational suggestion that I would have that we've used with some success is when you do an inspection to get all the neighbors invited. So not just that they see an example of a house that's compliant, but they can see the inspection and the person talking through all those things because it's probably not just one house that has that issue. And we have a lot of houses. I don't know how long it's going to take you to do an inspection of all of them. It seems to me that this could take years, but that's a way that you can have a bigger effect quick, more quickly uh, on you know, more houses. Uh, and the second, I have a, a question about the ordinance uh, uh, with respect to uh, when a property is sold. It seems to be looking for 100% compliance mm -hmm. and uh, appreciate your comments that some of these things take years to mitigate. It took me years getting working down the hill for my house. Um, but I could anticipate that there could be some surprises uh, when someone goes to sell their house that suddenly they have a whole bunch of work that they did not anticipate. And that's just, I don't know if there's any good solution to this, but uh, progress somehow. So thank you for your recommendation and comments. So first, um, as far as the inspection, I like that idea. That's a really great idea. I really like that. We'll have to look into encompassing that. Our goal right now is uh, we're, we're working on, we're gonna have another inspector starting in January. And then our goal is to have another one starting by mid to end of next year. So we are building our staffing so that we can meet all the parcels that are in our district. But right now, the goal will be about 2,000 parcels a year, So, the, which is why part of the three-year uh, phase plan that we have in place is because as far as us coming to your house for that initial inspection, we'll be hitting, the goal is to hit a house every three years. So you'll be on a three-year rotation, unless you want us to come back before that, which is fine. But as far as on a scheduled basis, that's how we're looking at that. There is in this ordinance, there's a section on resale. I didn't put it up on the slide. Um, only because it, there's not a lot to it in the ordinance. It just states that when it's, so Assembly Bill 38, when it came out and it only applies to homes in the very high fire severity zone that they do need to meet the requirements um, to do when we do the defensible space inspection that, and that's who it applies to. But when we go do a defensible space inspection that it has to be in compliance in order to sell their home. And usually the realtors reach out to us and we go out and do those inspections for those properties. And then, you know, once they have it to compliance, we write it off, they use that report at, that they submit with all the documents for resale. Thank you. Hello, Ann Copsill, uh, Minoka Road. Um, I didn't see, are there special requirements for extra bad trees like eucalyptus? What I saw in the picture, if you had a eucalyptus, but it was properly limbed and 20 or 30 feet apart, then would it be okay? Because homeowner, the homeowners that have those, that's especially expensive. But for the neighbors, it's especially worrying. <laughs> so 
So with with the so in new construction, no, mm -hmm. that's that's actually in the ordinance. Those the, those are one of the trees in there that cannot be planted anymore. But for existing, yes, as long as you're maintaining it, mm -hmm. you we don't have any authority to say to remove it. That would be up to a homeowner if they want to get rid of them because of their flammability. Um, so yes, so you're you're fine as long as you're maintaining it, pruning it, and limbing it, then you're fine. Okay, thanks. And I understood from the last, your answer to the last question, it'll take about three years to get through all the inspections in the Woodside Fire Protection District? In our whole district between Woodside, Portola Valley and the unincorporated area of San Mateo County that we have. So it's roughly around 25,000 parcels. I see, yeah. And do, will you um, do them randomly or you'll go do Street X or you'll pick the ones that are most risky and inspect those at first or what's your process traditionally we were hitting the ones that were the most severe but what we've decided to do since the goal is still to hit all those parcels uh the inspectors are going to have they kind of work out like i'm going to hit this area and they kind of just hit the whole area um it's not really streets it's more of a whole area but it is it it is at random but now with the system we have because it's going to be on a schedule it'll be a lot easier to now track because we have the software that helps us track, okay, we've done this one this year, we're gonna hit B, so it helps with our planning. Great, thanks. Thank you. My name is David Madison, and I'm fine and well. Um, I'm thinking about the vertical horizontal spacing and the ladder floor spacing requirement. Um, I walk a lot and I walk around town a lot and I see just vast amount of trees and shrubs that would be affected by the proposal. A lot of Portola Valley and Woodside, we live in a forest. And what's being advocated is really a radical change in that landscape. And I'm, I'm just wondering how that's going to work out when that reality comes down to each individual homeowner. Um, that's sort of a general thought about the scale of what, what's being asked. You can think about things like uh, you know, a, a row of trees with a privacy hedge underneath it. Well, that would be radically redone. You'd either have to take out all the trees to maintain the shrubs with the space in the proposed or shorten the privacy head and limb the trees way up, which is going to defeat the point of the privacy screen. Um, so I'm curious, have you done any sort of sample assessments of properties around town about the scale of what's involved? So my general comment is that I, I anticipate you'll, there'll be a lot of political pushback once the proposals come down to each individual property. So thank you for your comment. It is um, it is something that has been thought about and looked at and something that everybody has to understand is we're not talking about every vegetation everywhere. It's the hundred feet from a structure. That's the first thing. So that's where these requirements in the ordinance are coming into play. But if you've seen, this is just a quick example. Everybody drives down Alpine and Sandhill. I don't know if everyone notices the number of trees that are there, but for example, right now our fuel mitigation crew, they've been out there and it's been looking so fantastic on Sand Hill. The trees are all still there. They're just being maintained. All the dry vegetation around it has been removed and everything dead has been removed. It's just been cleaned up. And that's all that this ordinance is talking about is within those hundred feet of a structure is that maintenance only because of the fire spread. And like you said, when you go for walks and you see what we're surrounded with, that's not what we've always been surrounded with. That's just over years of time that that's where it's at. Um, so the goal is, yes, we know we have not done those types of assessments to be able to see what it looks like. We are not saying to remove all these trees everywhere. It's, it's, it's a starting point and it's a goal. We, this is, as a new ordinance and a new, with all the fires that we've had in the last five years, the devastation that this state has seen in communities and people's families and homes, obviously what's being done isn't working. 
So this is a different measure to start seeing because of all the research that's been done. This has been the new goal of saying, hey, we got to pave a way of doing something different if we want to stop these fires from happening or even happening here. Because right now, thankfully, that that hasn't happened. But we don't know if, if and when it will. But we have to start doing something to change it. So we're going to have to see how it looks in, you know, three, four, five years. And it's going to be up to all of us to work together to figure out what that's going to look like. I don't think it's going to be a, it's not a one-way street. It's going to be a collective effort. Everyone's input, everyone's, we want to work with everybody just as much as I'm sure everybody wants to work with us. But this is your community. We're just here to try and keep it safe. And we're just trying to mitigate when things go really bad, how are we going to make it better? So that's all I, that's, but thank you for your comment. I guess we'll see what happens. Any other questions? Uh, I'm Bill McFarland. I have three clarification, uh, clarification questions, and then I will uh, present the uh, opinion. Uh, the first is, how do these requirements relate to the state requirements regarding um, around the edge of the property? There is a fire break required. How uh, is that still required? And these, or how does how do they relate? For the fire break, well, the fuel break. Um, no, that's not in the ordinance as far as that. Um, so I know the fifty foot that's been there for a long time in our ordinance. It's now that part was taken out. There's no number. So that number could be 10 feet, 20 feet, 50 feet. It'll depend on structure and topography and what is able to be um, accomplished. So that's an assessment that's going to be done between homeowner and fire district when we go out. So I think that is in the ordinance that's under the section that says um, additional requirements. So that 50 foot setback is not in there anymore. So, so that requirement has been effectively removed and replaced with the zones. Mm -hmm. With the zones, as well as the additional requirements showing that if you're on an access road or a driveway, the district can say, depending on what your topography and your vegetation looks like, we, we need to move this up 10, 15 feet. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in reading it, um, it seemed to me that zone one and zone two have quite similar requirements. They both require the same vegetation spacing and so forth. Can you summarize what actually is the difference between zone one and zone two? What are the differences? The one of the biggest difference is the piles of wood. Okay. So that would be one of the major differences. Um, in zone one, you can have them. They just need to have a resistive cover. Um, zone two, you don't. And that, I think that is actually the only major difference. And um, yeah, I think that's the only major difference in there. And then in zone two, that's where you actually see the propane tank and sheds. Um, we don't want to see that in zone one. Okay. I Ooh. know it exists, so I understand that, but moving forward. Okay. Um, and then the other thing is that I found the distinction between a fire apparatus access route and a driveway unclear. When, when do you have a driveway and when do you have a fire apparatus access road? So in the in the definitions, we do define that. But basically, in layman's term, the fire apparatus road is also the commonly traveled road between, you know, the public, everybody who is on the driveway is just that private road that leads to your house doesn't go anywhere else. Uh, so I want to echo the concerns of the previous speaker. Um, I'm all for zone zero. I think that's great. You know, a five foot region around people's homes, that's great. And zone one seems fine as well. But zone two is quite distant, a hundred feet. If you take a one acre lot and you assume it is laid out as a square, simple example, it is 208 feet wide. You put your house in the middle of it, your entire lot is covered by the zone two rules. You then tile a bunch of these one acre houses, one after the other. That entire region is covered by the zone two rules. 
The zone two rules, if you look at the spacing requirements, particularly if you have some slope, the distance between trees required is quite large, much larger than what we typically have today in Portola Valley. So the homeowner has two options, one of which is to remove a large number of trees, which is kind of heartbreaking and quite expensive, or to clear all of the brush, all of the foliage between four inches off the ground and six feet or more. And I observe that this is what most people are choosing to do uh, when they come to sell their homes. And so you can drive through the town and you can see properties where this has been done. And I'm I, so sorry, you're, you're at your three minutes. So if you could okay. wrap it up. I, so and I'll wind up very quickly. I, I feel that this will have a quite detrimental effect on wildlife. Uh, deer, for example, are browse eaters. People think they eat grass, but they actually eat the twigs and branches of trees. They will not be able to live in that kind of environment well at all. Uh, it has a strong effect on privacy. You can see directly from one house to another with all of that foliage removed. It has a strong effect on noise, road noise. I, I'm, I'm so, so sorry, but if, if you could let the fire marshal answer the question now. Well, thank you for your comment. We will we are listening and taking in all the comments and we'll take yeah. those into consideration. So the question is, is there No, uh, I'm I'm so I am so sorry. These are Portola Valley town meeting rules. But thank you so much for your question. And we're gonna have another workshop in January 15th. And we'd love to see you then. Um is there any other questions? There you go. No, no, take your you got three minutes to ask your question or we got lots of time. Got me notice from their insurance company that their insurance will not be renewed. We got one last week, and the reason why they gave us a notice that it needs to be renewed is because this whole area is covered in um, trees and debris. And I appreciate what the fire department is trying to, the fire protection district is trying to do, because it will allow us to keep our insurance. You know, the insurance companies are not in a position to create a, a higher spend for us because we're in a higher risk zone because of the laws that have been adopted at the state level and we're stuck. So the only thing we're going to be able to do is as homeowners, basically what I'm trying to do right now is work with some kind of insurance company that will offer me insurance, not just for my house and for fire, but umbrella and car and all the other things that I have for my insurance. I was sort of hoping that someone else was going through it and they could help me figure it out. And then thank you very much for what you provided today because that is what we will end up be doing in the next 30 days because my insurance will run out in January. And also it keeps all y'all safe. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other questions about residents from residents? Okay, so I'm gonna take some questions um, online. Uh, Daniel Warren. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yeah, speak, yeah. speak up, Daniel. Hi, um, my name is Daniel Warren, and I live in Ladera, one of the unincorporated communities, and I serve on the board of the Ladera Community Association. We appreciate all the efforts that are being made to keep our community safe and make reasonable, proactive changes to improve our resilience. I also appreciate this opportunity to discuss the ordinance and hopefully influence some small tweaks or to preserve some of the character of our unique little neighborhood. Our parcels in Ladera are fairly small in comparison to Portola Valley and Woodside, and these rules will have a really dramatic impact on our neighborhood. Most of the rules will ban certain items in the entirety of our neighborhood since there are practically no areas that are 30 feet from a house and a property line and almost none that are 100 feet from a house. Almost all our lots in this community of 535 homes are well under an acre. Uh, I prepared a bunch of questions on individual items in the ordinance, but it seems like this format isn't really good for it. So I hope there is some other opportunity to discuss them in either written or interactive form. Um, and we would also like to invite you to come to one of our LCA board meetings soon to discuss these proposed rules with our community members and, and hear our, our feedback as they affect our community a little differently. Um, so I'll, I'll try to ask a few of the, the detailed questions here um, or just make a few comments. So for example, the ban on climbing vines within 100 feet, 
that would effectively ban all climbing vines in our neighborhood. But there are a lot of people that have been meticulously training vines for many years onto trellises somewhere in the yard. This doesn't really seem reasonable. I get keeping it off houses, but off trellises, that, that, I don't know about that one. Um, also, uh, the, the definitions of ornamental vegetative fuels and cultivated ground cover are, are missing. So, you know, many of our houses are hardscaped uh, with like about five feet from the house with plants right next to the houses. There are many houses have irrigation here, but it's unclear um, what of those irrigated plants are going to be uh, permitted to stick around. Um, in, in a similar manner, since again, our lots are not that big, there are many mature trees that are within five feet of the house. So, you know, limbing it up is, I don't know how relevant that is. Okay, I was waiting, <laughs> I wasn't sure if you were done. Um, first, thank you for your comments and feedback. I can um, provide my email so that you can, and that's for everybody, whoever wants to respond with with comments or questions, or if you have your, I know there's lots of little communities where you guys have your IO groups. Maybe if as a community, you come together with whatever questions and feedback you may have, put them all together and you can um, email them to me so that I have time to review it and be able to respond to them. Um, but as far as your comments, there's, there's a lot of information in your questions. The only thing I can give you as an answer is, I understand the challenges that your community we would have. There are other communities very similar to yours. And that is part of the reality of where we are living here or where you all live here is that these are the requirements that are being set forth only because of what studies have shown of how houses have been destroyed. So, um, and that's part of why the state of California, and that's what's in this template that we are trying to push as an ordinance. These are minimum standards. This isn't even really going stringent. Um, this is minimum. So this is a minimum that state of California put out as a whole because every, every jurisdiction is different, has different challenges. And this will definitely be a challenge um, for your community, but something definitely that we can work together and trying to figure out how to help support you and trying to making your area more resilient. Okay. You know, also, um, in addition, we've invited people who either have additional questions or can't attend to send an email to our committee. And that question will be put in our agenda packet and the committee may work with the fire marshal to maybe answer those questions either during a meeting or do some kind of a written, we'll, we'll figure out a way to get your questions answered. That's what we're here for. So please feel free to send in those emails before the January 15th next workshop so that we know how much more we have to do before January 15th to answer the questions. Okay, yeah, MJ, yeah. So uh, Daniel is from Ladera. So I, I was, and actually, I think what he asked for was a meeting with maybe his HOA board or something. Yeah, that like would be four, great. I think 400 homes. I think that would be a good idea. Yes, yeah, sorry. that, would be, a, that would be a perfect idea. And that way we can address all the, you know, maybe as an HOA, you can come together with whatever questions and concerns, put them together and send them to me prior so that I have time to prepare and then meet with your HOA. Most certainly. I'm sorry, I got- I Yeah, got I this. think he got- I uh, to say, yeah, yeah. it's five, 535 homes. Um, and if you haven't come to our area, it might be good to just drive by for a moment to see how different we are. Uh, yeah, I know. I've been up there. I do the inspe inspections up there for construction. Okay, so Daniel, you. Daniel, do you have all the information you need to set that up? Uh, I think I I saw a slide with her emails, um, the fire marshal. So uh, I will send an email. Yes. And you can always send an email to our committee and I'll I'll get back with you, whatever you need. Okay. Uh, Dave Cardinal. Hi there. Um, first, I love the fact we're having this meeting. It is huge compared to where we were a year or two ago. So kudos to 
Kim, the fire district, to Jennifer, MJ, and the other people on the committee. Oh, God, it's such a relief to actually talk about these things. So thank you. Um, I had one comment uh, just to put in the quiver. Um, you know, we love our house. We want our house to be super perfect fire-wise, and we expect it to be. But we, you know, it's an old house, and frankly, we expect the new owners, whoever they are, um, whenever that will be, to tear it down. And the housing stock in Portola Valley in general is still surprisingly quite old, and many of the people who own it are not surprisingly quite old. Um, <laughs> and many of them don't have the resources, including some very vocal people on the, the local PV forum to bring their, their house up to anything. And when they're sold, they're going to be shredded or scrapped or paved or whatever. So the only other thought is about in terms of sales, if there could, it's not immediate, but some consideration for, hey, I've got a 50 year old house. I'm not going to spend $35,000 to bring it up to code to sell it to you who are just going to bulldoze the whole lot. So that would be, I don't know. I don't know how to solve it, but I just wanted to point that out as an issue. Thanks. Thank you, David. I appreciate that. Uh, I just want people like yourselves and in the communities or maybe in similar situations as you are to know that that is part of one of the important reasons why having an inspector come out to your home and do the assessment is because we also have a lot of resources that we can offer to help support at least for the mitigation of around your property. We can just discuss plans, but it's easier when we meet with the homeowner. But I just want to let all the homeowners know that there are, please don't feel discouraged. Like there's, there's no end in sight. Like there's nothing you can do because there is, and we can work with you with that. Uh, Christy Corley. Yeah, excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, a few questions I have, and I, yeah, it feels good to have these conversations. Um, is it true that Los Trancos homes get 2000 towards defensible space from Woodside um, Fire Protection District? That's one question. And then I also experienced this uh, proposal that you're proposing at um, up in Donner Lake and they knocked on my door and I didn't set an appointment and uh, walked through my house and I spent quite a lot of time uh, with that report that you're suggesting and at the time I was also told that the insurance companies would have access to these addresses once they go online so I wanted to ask you if that's true um, but it it was quite expensive, quite stressful, and I still have not heard a response. So uh, I encourage you to also respond when the homeowner does such work and, and use uh, expenses towards it. Um, let's see, I love the idea of tours of three sample houses as we did three tours with ADUs. Uh, that neighbors could go to to see what what is an ADU. So I think that would be great to get done in early January. So uh, before the last meeting, if it be January 15th. Um, and then I want to bring to your attention, I'm concerned about a eucalyptus tree on the corner of Alpine and, and the Rastadero in the creek. And we know that another tree hit a 29-year-old and it was currently in the creek and that's when it fell. So if you could look to the left of the bridge as you turn right on the Rastadero when you're going east, look to the left of the bridge, look in the creek and ask what we can do to make those eucalyptus safe that will be uh, touching water if we have an El Nino. And then another question is, did the 10 foot change of limbs go to 15 feet away from houses? And the sixth question and final question is, we are 1800 uh, 
homes out of your 25,000 homes. So our community is 7.2% of the Woodside Fire District, and we are 2,000 homes. So uh, I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Thank you for all of your questions. We will. I will definitely need some time to answer all of them, um, especially because they're not. Uh, let me just hit first. Um, the so Los Trancos has a reimbursement program. It's actually it's uh, it's five thousand. So when you are going when there, that's why it's important to do your inspection with the inspector. Um, they will walk you through that process and explain to you how it works. But um, it's also we have that information on our website as well if you wanted details on that program and how it works. Um, your, the rest of your questions, I know MJ is putting them all down. So, <laughs> but as far as your concern with the eucalyptus trees, if you could please email the district so that I can get that or send it to me directly or go on our website and pull our, we do have a general email that our admin gets and she'll get that email. I wanna make sure we address that because I didn't write that. I wanna make sure we look at that. So thank you for bringing that concern up to our attention. And then, um, yeah, the rest of it, I'll get all this info, I'll gather all this information and be able to put up an update on all that. And I, I'll try to put it through, I'll put it through all the channels. We'll have to figure out a good way to get everyone's um, questions back to you, whether it gets posted on the web fire, our fire website, um, and then pushed out just like how we did all the flyers and information. So we'll figure out a good channel. But I could say most definitely that on our district website, the fire district, I will have those um, some responses to everyone's answers so that everyone can get some clarity on what their concerns are. Thank you, especially the insurance question, please. Yes, and that, yes, that, thank you. Um, that program is not funded by the district. The no. district simply administers it for- That is correct. That is actually through a funding in, in Los Trancos, but that we can talk about that program and give that information to you. Uh, and that's on their website. It's on the, the website it is. very clearly. Are they funded through the taxes, the yes. parcel taxes? Yeah. Okay, Dudley? Yes, thank you so much. And thank you, Kim, for this um, presentation, which is tremendously helpful. I especially appreciate your nuance and your willingness to work with homeowners and the emphasis on the fact that we're not trying to change everything all at once. I think that's hugely important. Um, my, my sort of question comment is related to the concerns about wildlife habitat. And I would encourage you as you develop educational materials to look for ways to identify what homeowners can do to preserve habitat without creating or maintaining fire hazards. Um, one of the questions that occurred to me in your slides was about dead trees because a standing dead tree of substantial size is great habitat for birds in particular and some other animals as well. You showed us a fallen tree and I totally get why the leafy end of any fallen tree needs to go as quickly as possible, but finding ways to identify the nuance between something that's not necessarily dangerous and something that is absolutely dangerous, is important to us as we learn how to cooperate with what you were asking us to do. The other thing that I notice is that in almost all fire-related presentations that show the defensible space distinctions, the examples use prototypical evergreen, tri triangular evergreen trees, and there's an enormous difference between evergreens, evergreen needle trees and oaks. And the canopy distance between oaks is very different from the canopy difference between redwoods in terms of how a fire would spread. And I wonder if as you develop educational materials, that's something else you might address and articulate a little more cleanly so that we know what you really need and what we can 
uh, work with. Thank you. Thank you, Dudley. Yes, that's good information to take in as we develop these guidelines. Um, it's great to have committees like the Wildfire Preparedness Committee and the Conservation Committee. Um, I know that there's a lot of people on the committees that have great knowledge and backgrounds in um, some of the information that we're going to need to be able to put together a good guideline for homeowners. So thank you for that information because we'll definitely keep that into consideration as well. Thanks. Uh, Jane W. Hello. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, but like a couple of the uh, previous speakers, I'm also concerned about the environment and the habitat and the species that we have that will lose a lot of their habitat if we go with the zone two. Um, I know that fire people, fire marshals, etc., hate poison oak, but it supports 50 species of bird. It also supports uh, deer and, you know, insects, butterflies, moths. And we've got to be able to consider these environments and habitats for the animals and the wildlife, along with these fire regulations, because otherwise they're just going to be living on concrete. We live on Shady Trail. If I go 100 feet around our house, I'm going to be down to Shady Trail and I'm going to have to clear gravel, cement, basically the hillside. And I really don't want to be doing that because it's just not not good for the environment and climate change. And I know that the fires are related to climate change, but we're just making it all worse if we destroy everything and just concrete. Um, we've got sticky monkey flower that grow over four inches tall. And the fire marshal has been round to my property a couple of years ago and said, it's brown. Yes, it's November, it's brown, and it's over four four inches tall, but it's a native plant and it's a habitat. So I really feel strongly that this blanket, 100 feet, is, is just so bad for the scrub oaks, the wood rat nests. I mean, what am I supposed to do, kick all the wood rats out? I don't, you know, it's, it's just horrific to me how much decimation is going to happen if we follow these guidelines to the letter. I'm also on the ASCC in Portola Valley. For years we've said no lights on um, numbers and I understand that you know now that you do need those for emergency purposes but that means we've got to change all those policies that says no lighting at gates, no lighting on numbers. Um, so there's a lot of things to be unpacked from this ordinance that affect people and homeowners that have historically tried to comply with all of these rules and regulations. And now that rule book's being torn up. So I really would like the environment and the plants and the native habitats considered more in the next meeting on the 15th of January. Thank you. Thank you very much for your feedback. There is a portion in the ordinance that does talk about the conservation of habitats and native plants and other types of vegetation. So there, there is that consideration in there. And again, the importance of walking with the inspector is it's not, um, we're not saying to remove everything. And the only hardscaping of gravel or cement is only the first five feet around your house, not everywhere else on your property. So I hope um, there's some some definition there with understanding what the what the guidelines are actually asking for. But I appreciate the feedback and we will take that into consideration as well for the next meeting. Thank you. So so I'm gonna be on Santa's naughty list and I'm gonna ask Nona a, a question. Um, as our conservation liaison, I, I looked at this ordinance and I looked at the conservation website and your recommendations. And, and I didn't see a big difference between maybe a little bit of difference, but I didn't, except for the zone zero, I, I kind of thought that this ordinance is following pretty closely what conservation is recommending. Am I, what, did I miss something or, or do you think conservation is going to have some concern? Should, 
I think <clears throat> what the conservation committee is trying to do is what many people here are suggesting we need, which is sort of think about the balance between habitat and fire risk reduction. And especially to try and identify places where the, the protocols could actually have perverse outcomes, sort of the, exactly the outcome we don't want. So for example, one thing conservation has been really concerned about is if you completely take out the understory in June, then you will have invasive, highly flammable thistles and stinkwort and other things that are spreading and actually um, exacerbating the fire risk. So I, I, our hope is that we can work with the fire marshal and the district to kind of fine tune mm -hmm. things in ways that allow us to think about how to preserve understory habitat, which can provide um, you know, refuge for small mammals that browse on thistles and things like that, um, so that we, we get the most, best of both mm -hmm. and really um, make properties safe. So yes, I think there is a lot of agreement between the, the new draft ordinance and the kinds of things we would like to see, but I think there are some, some aspects where I, we would like to fine tune it if possible. Yes, absolutely. And that was the point driven behind the guideline that we want to create is working with all the different committees and people who are experts and have a lot of knowledge so that we can make sure that we protect that part and still, like you said, get the best of both worlds. So um, we do, there, there are going to be challenges. This isn't going to be an easy process, but we need to work together and, and find those, define those lines of how we're going to you know, navigate through all this. So, you know, the ordinance, yes, I know it's a legal document and it's there, but it doesn't mean that that's the, the only answer to everything. So that's part of working collaboratively with different committees in the district. So thank you. So maybe next month when we talk about our, our agenda for 2024, we should be thinking about how this committee on conservation can work with some kind of education educational tools, and I don't know what that is, a sample garden, videos, outreach, but so that we, so we do fine tune it so we can, because I am concerned about habitat as well, but I'm also concerned about the house burning down, so it's, it's a tough issue. Okay, so, so Serena, I'm, uh, thank you so uh, for, to, uh, for patiently waiting, go for it. So I wanted, um, I just was looking for uh, clarification. When I go into uh, Calscape and look for um, ground covers to go um, in the five foot um, zone um, and with it, when it's gonna be watered, um, you know, you put in ground covers and you get things that are six foot high. Um, so that's obviously higher than you have in mind. Do you have a, um, a height limit that you're, um, that is not stated in here, but is your intent in terms of um, some incidental planting that might be in a, a gravel five foot zone with some planting, uh, ground cover planting in there? I don't have that answer for you right now, but it's something that I can, we can look into and have that answer for the next meeting. Cause I think that is, that is a good, that's a good question for what, what does ground cover mean? Again, something part of what we were looking at for the guideline is to be able to address all the zones and give you uh, more detailed information. So we will take that one in as well so that we can provide that feedback next, next workshop. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other questions from attendees? So, so, I, have, so I have a question. Um, so I know, and MJ, I know you're working on the zone zero, I think it's workshop with Cal Fire. What is it called a workshop? Work group. So zone zero is coming. We're just doing it a year early. I mean, Cal Fire's been working on zone zero. Zone one, zone two, this is nothing new. This is, this is Cal Fire. So how different 
do you think Cal Fire Zone Zeros, and I'm asking both you and Kim, MJ, how different do you think Cal Fire Zone Zero is gonna be from our Zone Zero? And, and will that help clarify, will they have a ton of information when they come, come out in a year and say, this is what our Zone Zero looks like? So right now, from what I've seen on CAL FIRE's website, when they go over their zones, you know, they say this is not in law yet, that the requirements of zone zero are mirror what our zone zero is. There's really no, there's no difference in it. Yeah, I can tell you that the zone zero that the work group worked on is even more strict than what's in this B space now. The only thing is that that zone zero was supposed to go through this fall and it has ended up in some kind of purgatory. I haven't been able to find out <laughs> what's happening with that. So it's not clear to me what is, is really gonna happen with the state. And, and at this point, I, I don't even wanna guess anymore. So. Okay, uh, well, I just would like to thank you again for being here. And um, if anyone has questions they want us to bring up before the January 15th, 15th meeting, that, that would be fine. Email us, the, the, 5th, the January 15th meeting is gonna be at 6.30. So we're hoping people that, that uh, may not have been able to make it at four o'clock can make it. And um, this has just been so informative and we're very, very grateful for your time. Oh, thank you. Okay. Happy that you're able to host us. That really helped. <laughs> thank you. Happy to do it. Okay, so um, the agenda for next month uh, will be um, our plans for 2024. We'll be discussing that. We'll be discussing officers. I know that um, Kim will be back. And we'll probably be discussing what she might w want in our 2024 um, plans. And uh, we talked a little bit about wildfire evacuation. She, she may talk to us a little bit about wildfire evacuation and what's going on with that. Uh, quorum check for next month. Is everyone here for December 20th? Okay. With that, yes, go ahead. So actually, I, I got some new information yesterday about this decking materials question, but I need to talk it over with E, and also I need to write up something and get it approved by the CAL FIRE guy I talked to, but, but that should be on the agenda for next month. I already had it on there, and I, I was just going to let the resident know that we're researching that. Yes. Okay. Uh, would someone like to make a motion to adjourn? Second. Okay. Vote. Yes. Let's adjourn. Thank you. Yep. Five. Fifty. Five. Um,